So your album, which I cannot believe is your 15th album, it's kind of <laughs> crazy. Uh, it's called A Simple Trip, Trick to Happiness. And um, I'm just going to get into the deep end of the questions because I think we're all wondering what that trick is. We're all looking for that, like that one little thing that will make us happy. So like, do you have a trick? What's the, what's the solution to life? Well, I think the title <laughs> of the album was slightly tongue in cheek because, uh, you know, happiness is, can be difficult to achieve. Yeah. Um, but that being said, I feel like just putting it out there that there could be some simple tricks to happiness make people start looking for them. And I actually have start walk started walking around with my little handy dandy phone and recording myself explaining different simple tricks to happiness. Because I, did, I do realize through the day, like even this morning I went out for a walk and I, and I was wearing this, when I got dressed, I pulled out this huge, it's like bubblegum pink, huge sweatshirt that's just puffy and huge. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? This is a simple trick to happiness. Pick something out of your closet that's big and puffy and huge and comfy. That's number one simple trick. I look like I was like college after my 17th pizza that day. <laughs> but it's so comfortable and it's my life and I get to look at it. And second of all, it was pink, which is my favorite color, which makes me happy. That's two tricks. Three, I was out taking a walk and that made me so happy. And sometimes we forget those little small things. The little things. And that happens a lot on the record. There's a lot of talk about the small things, the small things that get in your way. Don't let them get in your way, but also appreciating the small things. So it's kind of like finding that balance, being able to go through the day and whether it's like, oh my gosh, I love my shoes, or oh, my cat smiled at me, or wow, <laughs> that toast sure was crunchy. You know, like, there's little tiny things um, that can really bring you happiness and joy. There's also things like being active uh, in your psychological, emotional life. Like, the, the first song on the record is called Doesn't It Feel Good, mm -hmm, and it's about, about it's about getting out of stuff that you shouldn't be in anymore. Whether it's a relationship, a job, you should always be respectful, you know, don't just like walk out of a job and don't tell anyone, or a, re a relationship. But, you know, I, it's really, it, it's funny, I, I talk to a lot of people. I have two kids in school, at one of my kids' school, the drop-off, we walk there and we talk to a lot of parents in and out of the school. I take dance classes, I have friends and studio sessions and all these different things. We were hanging out before the official interview started. <laughs> um, but that connection is also like a huge source of joy and happiness for me. Like it's so much fun to like hang out and talk and like talk about something that's exciting or depressing. That engagement is, is just such a big deal. Like, and, and sometimes things that you might say to me or that I might say to you are just second nature. You wouldn't even think about it. You know, like, oh, I bought this thing at this store. Like, you did what? Like, to you, it's like, yeah, this store. Or, you know, it might be something deeper than buying something at a store. Well, I enjoy the conversation we had about your awesome shirt. My shirt, which is Wheel of Fortune, very important. With the dog. <laughs> it can bring me lots of joy. <laughs> with That's shiny glasses. That's a simple glasses. trick to happiness like, right there. Shiny glasses. Um, but those, those moments of connection, of, of talking to each other, of and sometimes hearing something that to you might just be something second nature to me might be a huge big piece of advice same you know and it goes all the different ways but there's a lot of that kind of information and 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 kind of stories on on my new record it comes through stories but um so some of those are simple tricks to happiness just being able to 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 connect with people and talk about life you know well that's actually it's a kind of a hot topic that people aren't feeling as happy these days and do you think it's because of a lack of connection because of social media or whatever that we're texting or right. or facebooking or whatever more than we're having sit down conversations or phone conversations i think that's definitely part of it i also think that even more than the lack of connection because i do find joy in looking at people's facebook posts and certain Instagram posts, cats, especially, and like baking and miniature things, like, and Barbie stuff. Um, but what I find is that it's just too much stuff crammed in. Our tanks are over full. We're always pouring. It's not glass half full, glass empty. It's glass, like, uh, trying to keep the water in the glass. It's just too much. It's too fast. We don't have the pace or the time or the brain capacity to be able to keep up with it all. And I think, you know, our minds are spinning. We've, it just, it puts too much on our plate. And so I think that causes unhappiness. Plus, there's politics. Yep. We won't get super deep into that right now. But um, you know, the way the world is can be really um, frustrating because we feel like things are out of our hands. Uh, and and then that on top of that with social media, where you feel like you have so much control, but maybe you don't. But you need to take one step in front of the other to gain that control, to do the small things you can do to help make a change. Whether it's vote, which is kind of a big thing, or you know 
what you choose to do in your life with your time and your energy uh, and your values. So yeah, I think, but I think unhappiness can be that. Mm -hmm. And also sometimes it's not about happiness. I say happiness on the record. For me, when I think of happiness, I think more of being engaged. You know, like I am so happy when I'm doing a crossword puzzle. When I am, when I am sitting and petting the cat and not doing 7,000 things, literally like a cat, my cat in the kitchen. <laughs> um, you know, when I, when you, I, I, but when I'm doing too many things layered on top of each other, it, you start losing that engagement. You start losing, you start, you start losing that joy, you know? Well, you were mentioning politics and I'm just curious, since you came up at the 90s, I recall that being a, pr a pretty politically motivated time. There was rock the vote. Rock for Choice. Um, there was there were a lot of women in rock. Not that there aren't now, but like it seemed like they were at the forefront. You know, we had you know there was one year at the Grammys where all five the year that Lauryn Hill won, all five of the Album of the Year nominees were women. It was like Garbage, Madonna, Sheryl Crow, Lauryn Hill, and some someone else. I forget. I'm sorry, but uh, it was all women. And I don't know, just what do you think has changed since then? I had a lot of hope in the 90s, both as a woman and also like in the power of rock to change things and music to change things. I think things go in cycles. And I think I will say as a mother of, a, of two young children, I have a little boy and a little girl, uh, there's way more girls playing music than there used to be when I was growing up. When I was growing up, I was one of the only kids, other than maybe classical piano, I was really one of the only kids playing electric guitar. It was like me, mm. Stephanie, she, she showed me some Rolling Stones songs, I think. But like, there, there were not a lot of kids out there. Now I feel like it, it's becoming more common. Um, I think at the time in the 90s, there was like a rebellious moment, like we have to show people that women can play music. In fact, back in the 90s, I remember when Sarah McLachlan asked me to play Lilith Fair. There was official years of Lilith Fair, and then there was the, the non-official sort of tester year that she asked me to be a part of. And at first I didn't want to do it because I thought, I went to an all-girls school. I'd, I never wanted to, even when I, I remember um, being a musician and being a girl, I didn't want to be like good for a girl. I was just a musician and it was this big thing. I didn't want to be separated. I felt like, come on, let's just move forward. But then for the Sarah McLaughlin, the Lilith Fair tour, I realized she was asking me to play a concert with like Patti Smith, Amy Mann, Paula Cole, herself. I love Sarah McLaughlin. I was like, well, I got to play that concert. It's a bunch of awesome musicians, and I get to like hang out with them and talk to them and play music with them. And it continued like that. It was Emily Harris, and you know, you name it. Everybody was playing, and it was a great community. And then I realized there, once I was playing in the World Fair, there was something important to sort of bonding together. Mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of men there. They were playing in the bands and engineering and, and a lot of other things having to do with the tour. And in the audience. And in the audience. Myth that it was all like yeah. women in Birkenstocks yeah, in the no. audience. But yeah. no, it was mixed. A lot of us were not wearing bar Birkenstocks. <laughs> Don't wear Birkenstocks. I remember I the first pair of Birkenstocks I got, my friend David, she, he cried. He's like, how could you get those? I was like, I'm going to brown? Like, we <laughs> It didn't work out for me. Um, but, I, but I felt like what happened later, like realizing, you know, just the musicians, we were hanging out as a community. Backstage, we were hanging out, talking. Also, as a musician, you don't always, often end up talking to so many musicians and hanging out with them because you're, your you're doing your own thing. You're making your albums. You're on tour by yourself or with another band. So having that camaraderie and having that strength, and also in the 90s, they would say things. You hear it over and over again. Oh, we're already playing Sheryl Crow. We can't play another woman musician. We're playing you. We can't play another. It's happening in country still all the time. It's crazy. Like you would think they would just play good music because they want to make money. Radio stations, which is, you know, they want people to listen, so they should just play music people like. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, so I feel like at that point there was a rebellious moment. Same politically. It just com it, we had just come out of this big Republican 1980s, and I think people they wanted a change. Um, so I think. You know, it is it is more common for women to be musicians. I will also say, as a a grown woman, <laughs> I'm so grown. Um, as a mom, it's hard to do everything. It's hard to be on the road. It's hard to go into the studio. It's hard to excuse yourself to go write a song. I, you need a really good team around you to be able to do. If that's your path, if that's your choice to have children, it. As much as I would like to say, we can all do everything and everyone shares equally in the tasks of raising children. So far, I haven't exactly, that, that's still evolving. And that takes a lot of time and emotion and emotional energy and creative energy and a lot of logistics to figure that out. 
And so I think that sometimes prevents more women from being musicians. It's, mm -hmm. it's really, the logistics honestly are very complicated. And I'm not sure if some of the men musicians and guy musicians I know really have to deal with that. You know, they can go to their back house and woodshed and write. Somebody's got to pick the rice off the floor. Somebody's got to like scoop the litter box and like, <laughs> you know, do all that stuff in addition to like being glamorous and going on red carpets and being, you know, like I said, woodshedding and actually doing the creative work and being in the studio. So it's, the balance is, uh, is tough. I guess that's true for so that's women a, in any career. I exactly, guess. it's a yeah. bigger issue, I think. Well, going back to Lula Fair, because I was planning to ask you about that, so I'm glad okay. you brought it up. Um, do you think it's time for Lula Fair to come back? There was a big, wonderful oral history of it in Vanity Fair last year. I'm not sure if you were a part I, I was, yeah, I yeah. did a lot of uh, Q and A's with Vanity Fair for that. I yeah. That. It was cool, it was like the, all these quotes, basically. And I know they tried to bring it back about 10 years ago in 2010, yeah. there were, I think, just some logistical, like, industry things that made it like not work out. I'm not exactly yeah. sure why. But do you think now, especially since you're saying that there are so many more women picking up guitars or picking up instruments, yeah. could we bring it back? I would love to see it come back. I think it would be cool in that, again, in the evolution of life and people, there still needs to be an extra push for so many different groups of people, mm -hmm. including women. Um, and I think Lilith Fair in particular had a, like I said, community before, but if you would walk in the audience and talk to people, there was just such a feeling of community. And it was, because it was women in music and not like a jam band fest or a mariachi fest or a particular genre, there were a lot of different genres. And it was kind of like a listening to music and enjoying music fest. Um, if you can get that feeling from a festival, it's really cool. Like I've been to some festivals here and there where I feel like it, it kind of does capture that. And Brandy like, Carlisle's doing something like that. Oh, is Brandy doing something like she that? She has done a couple. Oh yeah, I saw she put something yeah. together on Instagram. Um, I, it is something cool to bring people together and I still think uh, kids and young women need that example to see that, that you can do it, that, that it is something for you to do. Um, so even just for that, just to have that great community and to bring a lot of different genres of music together, that would be cool. I've talked about this with a lot of peers, including some people who've played uh, a little fair and people like Shirley Manson. Do you have any theories as to why it seems like the progress that was being made in the 90s with not just female solo artists, but also a lot of co-ed bands? I mean, alternative rock, it was all about Hole and The Breeders and No Doubt. And I felt like at that time, it sounds like negative. I was like, problems are solved. Yay. Yeah, everything's done. Everything's fine I now. And then like it changed. Bands, like head in the heart. And yeah, maybe it's more of rock changing. And I, it might be. And, and who's friends with whom? And uh, I do feel like like the younger generations, there's a lot more equality. I, I don't know. I live in Los Angeles. It's a bit of a bubble. And I see things changing. Um, I I don't know. I, I, I you, you can't really control who does what with whom. Like who feels like being in a band with somebody else. And like I said, it's a bigger issue. It's like, mm -hmm. you, you know, what what are people's interests? Do I I I don't think I've talked to a lot of women musicians and younger girl musicians who feel um, held back by society. Have yeah. you? Not not as much as as people probably would think. I don't, I don't, I feel like people just need to do it, you know, mm -hmm. they, like maybe they are being held back. I, and I hope that the young women musicians out there know that there is a support system. There's so many of us who are women who are musicians, especially now with social media, who are open to conversations or whatever kind of support or encouragement that is. Um, there are, there, I, I'm a, uh, I try to do this thing every year called Right Girl. I'm not one of the people who started oh, right it yeah. or, or anything, but um, it's, a, it's a group put together by, in Los Angeles and all these young writers and, and mentors who are women, you get to work with young writers who are learning to write about their lives. And for us, it's songwriting. And we take their lyrics at the end of the day in a big auditorium when we play, we make up music on the spot basically for these lyrics and we create songs and that's so empowering. So I hope people know that there are places they can turn to and people they can turn to to help support them. Um, and then again, like I said, I think there's a larger thing, like trying to figure out as a woman, as a person, how do you do it? How do you do it all? Like, what, what are your choices? What do you want to do? Is that like a theme on the album, kind of? Like, you know, it doesn't it feel good. The song you mentioned is sort of about getting out of things that, obligations that aren't serving Yes, you. and again, uh, exactly, that's a good way to put it. You know, if you're in a relationship and you keep feeling like 
this looks good on paper, but it doesn't feel right at all. At a certain point, you, it's, it's your one life, you know? Or if you're in this job and you looks good on paper and everybody's proud of you and everything's great, but you're not happy. You know, at a certain point, you wanna take a look at it and move forward. Um, that's in the song, doesn't it feel good? I'm gonna look at this song. <laughs> Uh, Skeleton is a song on there that's more about looking at old friendships. Uh, you know, sometimes you have relationships that are so important to you and it's, I guess that's the part of the album. Some of the songs are just really, really personal and they're putting myself out there. When I first started writing songs, I didn't want to write songs that were like journal entries. They needed to be crafted. They needed to be mysterious too. Like uh, I listen to The Cure and Led Zeppelin a lot. Mm -hmm. Like, what are they talking about? I don't know, but it's very mysterious, <laughs> you know? Um, but as I've moved along and heard a lot of other songwriters, I realized telling your own story is, is a great way to connect with others again. Like when I play concerts, and some of the songs that I find resonate best with the audience are ones that are more personal. So the song Skeleton is that. It's about looking back at a, back at a relationship and admitting like, I don't know if the other person cared about me. You know that horrible feeling where it's so special to you, but is it special to them? So that's what that song is. It's like burying my heart. Uh, in that song. Well, one song that you definitely bear your heart in is I Want to Go First. <laughs> That's almost goth. Yeah, it's, it's a, a morbid it's song. It's very goth. <laughs> it's it a is, morbid song. It's very goth. In fact, in the video we just did, there's like silhouettes and the, the candles and very gothic. I, I'm actually I'm literally wearing like a Victorian, uh, Japanese, but Victorian style shirt that's black in it. Nice. But it's a song. Yeah, tell uh, me about it. It's a song. It's funny. My parents said to me, they said, are you, they heard the, this, the record when it was almost done and they said, you're not putting that song on the album right now. <laughs> because it's really depressing. Because it's a song, and I said, Mom, have you ever heard of Edward Gorey? Or, you know, it's like, it's sardonic. It's, it's going so exact, you know, do you wanna be, it, it's basically saying I'd rather die first than have this person I love so much die before me. Which I don't personally ever wanna die. Like I, I love life, but, but I like the story of just having that, bearing your soul and you're so emotional and you're so in love that you, you would rather do anything than die before the other person dies. <laughs> yeah, but it's but poetic. If, if it's someone's poetic. saying it to me, I'd be like, thanks? Like, <laughs> it's extreme. <laughs> it's very extreme. I say it's extreme in the song, but it is. And, and then it's just this wash of kind of gothic, beautiful music. So, Yeah, I liked it. Just like, yeah, it's intense. It's almost like, I don't want to say stalkery or whatever, but it, it's like kind of emo. Yeah. It is a little emo. It's funny, I had another song on my last record that was a little stalker. It was very, it was actually about stalking. Tegan and Sarah wrote it, and it was oh. about, it, it was basically about stalking somebody. And here's the, here's another one. <laughs> I'm so in love with you. Unfortunately, most of us know what that feels like. Yeah. Maybe far, far in our past when we were younger. You mean being on that the feeling end of, or being on the giving end? Being on the giving end of like yeah. loving somebody so much that you like, oh. Yeah. Well, I do want to go back to the You're beginning. Like, no, not me. Anyway. <laughs> Obviously, um, you first came to the scene from Stay and from Reality Bites. And I forgot uh, when I was doing the research for this interview that you were the first independent artist to have a number one. You didn't have a record deal at that time when you had a number right. one single. Yes. So tell me how that came about. It was, it was um, a really cool situation. I'd been playing music for a long time, all through college and after college. I felt like it was for years. It was like two more years. Um, I was living in New York and I was playing a lot of local shows with my band or, or as a singer songwriter. Um, and Ethan Hawke was a friend of mine. We had gotten to be friends through another friend who was an actor who I went to college with. And he, we ended up being neighbors as well. So there was this big group of friends of us, musicians and songwriters and actors and playwrights. And we'd just all run around New York together and support each other as well, like go to each other's plays, or I would write music for Ethan's theater company. Ethan would come see me play. So along the way, he asked me for a copy of my song, Stay, which I had written like maybe a year before that. And I had just recorded a, a version of the song with my band, Nine Stories, in an apartment on 52nd Street in the studio where we worked a lot. And um, so Ethan asked me for a copy of the song. He said, you know, they're putting a lot of songs into this movie that I'm, that I'm in right now, that I'm working on shooting. and." I think your song might be good for them to hear. So um, we passed the song Stay on a cassette tape along to Ethan, and Ethan uh, passed it along to the producers of the movie, Stacey Scher, uh, music supervisors, Karen Rackman, Ben Stiller was directing it. All the different people were very involved in all of the elements of the, sh of the movie. And they decided to put the song into the movie. They, they, were, they put a bunch of different music in their crowded house. and The Knack. The Knack, who I love. <laughs> I love The Knack. Um, 
So they put all these songs into the movie, and I did not have a record deal. And with my attorney, we decided not to sign a deal to keep it independent and to license the song to RCA. And so it, it was on the soundtrack as well as in the movie. And um, we, Ethan made a video. We made a video with yeah, Ethan. Yeah, he directed the video. Yeah, which I think the record company let us make a video because Ethan Hawke was directing it because he was <laughs> like a movie star. But but really the great part about the, the video was that he decided to shoot it all in one take. I was about to ask if it was because some videos that are one take aren't really. There's like a very clever it's edit. It's really one take. Wow. It is one take. I how, did that video many, many times. I was going to say, how many run-throughs did you do? I did. We shot it a million times. And Ethan already knew exactly how he wanted it to go. Even when he explained the idea of it, we were in his kitchen and he, and he you know, he's like with his camera. He's like, and you'll stand there and then it'll go around here and then you'll come around here. And, you know, he had it all like kind of choreographed. And I was going to sing to the camera like I was talking to somebody. So we had it all worked out. And that was a great story to tell that Ethan had directed it and that it was a one take video. And it communicated the song well. And it sounded really different than other videos that were on. That sounded weird. It sounded different than other videos that were on it MTV also at the different. time. It looked different. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, it was great to have uh, like an independent start because I'd been doing music for so long up to that point, even though I was so young. Um, it was nice to have that that kind of security and that uh, sense of creative control that I was going to be able to continue on till now um, because the record company saw that I had done this. Not to say record companies didn't give me suggestions for years and years, but I had this confidence that, look, we know what we're doing when we make things the way we want to make them. We will collaborate to a certain extent, but it was nice having the song that was just written the way I wanted to, which was an unusual song with no chorus. Wait, and it has no chorus. It has no chorus. But I people know, know the words. I get people sing me the words. Well, it starts with the title of the song, like in the yeah, yeah. first like, line. Say? Oh, sort of, yeah. People do call it you say, but it's, it, it kind of unfolds and then it closes back up like a book. Do you think that could happen nowadays? That's now there's. I mean, I, it sounds like there were a lot of cooks in the kitchen then, yeah. but it seems like an independent artist getting a huge song in a big movie. Totally. You think it could happen? Hundred percent. Okay. It could happen because you can get your music out there now. Mm. The biggest thing, you know, dances go viral and funny stuff goes viral. <laughs> funny stuff. Funny things go viral. Cats. Cats go viral. Thing, things go viral. Viruses go viral. Um, <laughs> Things go viral on the internet. You can get stuff out there. I feel like this is the prime time, but it is. There are so many things out there to have that much focus on one thing to make it a hit. Yeah, that's the thing. Macklemore it's like you, had a number one hit. Macklemore, Macklemore is the one who beat your record. Yes, because you were the only independent artist to yes. go to number one, if I'm not mistaken. Until yes. he came around with was it was it thrift shop? Yeah. So have you and Macklemore met? I yeah, we met. We met. <laughs> were you like, like, damn it? I Macklemore? said, hey, and he was like, oh, and I'm like, come on. <laughs> I, I really like his music. So, yeah, I um, do too. I met him and Ryan uh, at a, an event. I said Ryan, like I'm really good friends with him. Um, but Ryan I did, Lewis I did meet to them. those. Yeah. Ryan Lewis. Yeah, I met them at an event, and I do love what they do. But I think also you have to understand that independent is a little bit relative. You always end up with teams of people around you. You end up with publicists and radio promotion people. When things get to a certain point, there is often a team of people, even if it's not a record label. True. So, so when that video hit, that one, and are there a lot of outtakes of it, by the way, if you like tripping so over outtakes. stuff? There's so many outtakes, and I also had like a bone to pick with Ethan. I really wanted my band to be in the video because I didn't want to be seen as this person. I, I played guitar. I was like, I, people need to see that I really play guitar. Like this is really important to me, my guitar playing. You know, uh, I've studied it for years, and I'm super into it. And they need to see my band because I'm not like a girl without a guitar. I'm like a person with a band. And so we shot a handful of takes with the band. Oh. But the, but the um, artistic expression of just me singing without my guitar told the story so much better than me and my band and my guitar that I just, you know, went with a stronger creative vision. Understandable. So when that video came out, you became famous for your glasses. You're still famous for them. When I saw you before this interview, you, didn't, you were having your makeup done and you didn't have them all, almost didn't recognize you for a minute. Like, you became known for your glasses. I know you have a glasses eyewear line, right? Yes. So I'm just curious because I, I wear contacts. I got LASIK, then my eyes got worse because of something called yes. the aging process. So I wear Actually, contacts. I got now. a little better. Oh, really? Isn't that weird? Yeah. But I wore glasses for many years, for like yeah. most of high school, college. Uh, I wore glasses for like about 15 years. Yeah. So, and I was wearing glasses when that video came out. And I'm just curious if when, because you were so known for it, if you got a lot of response from girls like me who were like, oh, 
glasses are chic now. Glasses are cute. Like, yes. did it, did all of a sudden like everybody want to wear glasses? Like now you like glasses were hot. Yes. I feel like it, you were a real trendsetter. It was. It, it you know it's funny because I'm gonna move my feet because I'm so short I can barely reach the ground. Um, I hear you. When I was growing up, I always found really fun, interesting glasses, which you probably did too. But you know, you'd, you, you it was either really extremely unusual or very you know, preppy or something. And I'd find the ones that were like green malachite on the top or like this weird purple stripes or black and white, I, just all these crazy glasses. People always associated me with my glasses, but I really needed glasses and I'm pretty allergic to contacts. Like I can't wear them for long periods of time. But when it, uh, it was funny because when my song became popular and I was on the radio and in videos, people stopped me all the time after a while and said, oh my gosh, I feel comfortable wearing my glasses because you wear yours. And that still happens today. People stop me at airports and grocery stores and they say, oh, my little girl will wear her glasses because you wear glasses. Hmm. And so I think even though at the beginning when you know I was starting to get played on the radio and all that stuff um, and sort of commercial success was happening, I didn't want to talk about my glasses. I wanted to talk about my music and my guitar playing and all this other stuff which I thought was was more you know, musician-y, I realized along the way that there was such a connection, and it's such a hobby of mine as well, like finding cool glasses, that that discussion was really important to me to, to see how it had changed changed some kid's life. And also, you know, it was like like-minded people. We were wearing glasses. This is what we wear. We like Hello Kitty. This is, this is just, it's my community. You know, like, I like that. I like connecting with that. And that's why I decided eventually to have an eyewear line um, instead of being sort of put off by the glasses, I was like, that's actually my people. These are my people, you know? And, and I'm glad that women will now look prettier if they wear glasses with a little bit of a lift. They might not all look like hat-eye glasses in my eyewear line, but they all have a little bit of a lift and it lifts people's faces and they don't have to look like sad. You know, sometimes glasses are a little droopy and it looks very sad, but um, they don't look sad in my glasses. They look happy in my glasses and beautiful. I'm curious if when you started out in your career, and especially when you eventually signed to a label, was there anyone advising you to ditch the glasses, like to look, you know, more, I don't know, whatever, sexy or whatever, get contacts, get LASIK, you know, these glasses are, are pigeonholing your image, right. that sort of thing. Nobody ever told me not to wear them, which was, that's good because that would have been complicated. Um, <laughs> You're like, I like seeing. I will say though, early on when, when Stay became popular, there were some photo shoots and things like, I remember doing a photo shoot for Interview Magazine and I was wearing this awesome crocheted Betsy Johnson. It was either Betsy Johnson or Anna Sui. I feel like it was Betsy Johnson. People who I loved, Betsy mm -hmm. Johnson, I'd been wearing it for favorite, years. Yeah. And, amazing, and it was this crocheted vest. And I wore it like a, like a tunic dress. But the way the photo was taken, it was so artsy. My hair was fluffy. It was a little bit blurred and dark. The blacks were very black. Like everything looked kind of dark. And I remember somebody called me a waif. And I realized right away that even though this beautiful black crocheted thing with these like almost icing roses looking crocheted flowers, I needed to be really careful about what I wear, how people photograph me. I, I was in an Us Magazine shoot with a great photographer who I love, but somehow I let the stylist put me in these cheddar cheese yellow tights with this like, uh, again, maybe Betsy Johnson. It was like a, a really cute short dress with these big flowers, which was very cute and pop art but I didn't really like that yellow color, but I still wore it because I was like, well, I'll try it. It didn't present me like me. You know, like even wearing a middle part instead of a side part, it didn't represent me. And I feel like that's an important thing for people, musicians for sure, or people who are out there, you know, getting their picture taken, but it's important to present yourself as yourself. And, and of course it's good to be open to other people's ideas because you might learn something that you didn't know, might, you know, look cute on you or be an idea of something you'd want to try to make your life better or look better in some way. But it's so important to stick to your guns. And I was such a, like a strong, business-minded, super into writing music and, and performing music and knowing about the music business. And yet here I was in this picture before I had been really established, looking really like waif-like, which was, was supposedly negative. It was like I was very thin and, oh. you know, very shy and very like, you know, that's not me. It's an interesting artistic expression, but it's really that, that's what I remember a lot from those days. Not about my glasses, but more about making sure I was presented in a way mm. that felt like me, that looked like me, having that kind of creative control over your presentation of yourself. And I think that's so important, whether you're a business person or an artist, you, you want to create freedom for yourself in your life, <laughs> you know, and, and your ability to continue to express yourself and not be judged before you have an ability to be yourself. 
the waif thing was that was a very 90s thing like the kate moss type model yes i yes. mean she's naturally a very skinny girl yes. but yeah sort of looking it's yeah it's interesting I, i'm just thinking about this aloud now yes. because a lot of the women in pop culture particularly music were very strong whether yeah. it was kim gordon or shirley manson or kim Deal, courtney love or, courtney yeah. But then in the, the models, the supermodels, a yeah. lot of them, not all of them, Naomi Campbell was like a super yeah. babe, but like a lot of them, there was that like wafy thing going on, that right. heroin chic thing. Exactly. And sometimes that had more to do with the style, the, the, the brands that they were representing, not themselves. Um, but it's interesting when you realize you are the brand, you know, like mm -hmm. not that you should be a brand, but you know what I mean? Like it's important to creative control. You know, collaboration, but creative control. I'm glad no one ever actually said, you know, get the LASIK or whatever. I'm glad no one thought that, you know, you needed to ditch the glasses because they are such a, what are your, what are your. I would have uh, said no anyway. I'm such a bossy. <laughs> no, boss. you would have been like, I need to be able to see when I know, I know. I'm like, well, I can see now. Yeah. Well, I, I would love to talk to you about something when we're talking about image and brand because can we talk about your reality show number one thing? Yes. I loved that show. Because I like, I mean, I watch a lot of reality shows, and I, I watched The Bachelor last night. I watched Married at First Sight. I watch any dating show, and all the really cheesy ones like Blind Dates. And I haven't seen. I used to love the Shipmates. Is that Blind? Oh, I used to love. <laughs> da, 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 da. Chris Hardwick that hosted music? that one. Yeah, Chris Singled Hardwick. out. Yes, I loved those early reality shows. Oh my god. But yours was actually more like a docu series, and it was yes. legit, and it was serious for people who don't remember it. It was on E, and it was about your yes. search to find a mate. You know. You were newly single, yes. coming out of a, really, a long yes. relationship, and you wanted to get married. You wanted to have kids, and yeah. here you are in the unusual predicament of being a celebrity who just wants to date, kind of like a normal person. Yeah, and also and being that. yeah, it was. I had made a show called uh, on the Food Network called Dweezil and Lisa. We had a f Food Network show that had kind of a reality feel about it, although it was completely produced. It was supposed to be about musicians and being a musician and touring and all the food we get to eat and how we learn about food in our lives being foodies. But um, the production of that, even though we were producers, sometimes it got away from us and things got turned into the network that we never would have approved. And then that became the thing that was on TV. So for this reality show, at first I didn't want to do a reality show because, I mean, that sounds really stupid to do a reality show, um, even though, yes, we enjoy them. Um, but it was a reality show with lots of control. Again, the control issue. But I worked with a great company called Stick Figure who did make documentaries. That's mm -hmm. what they did. They were documentary filmmakers. And I made sure I was in the edits. So we had great editors, but when it came to the final edits, I would always be a part of the edits because I wanted to make sure the stories that we were telling about me being a person in my late 30s, it was also about that, being so involved in my career trying to take the time aside to focus on my relationships because you really sometimes have to decide to focus on relationships, not just, it doesn't always just happen. Even in my head, I thought, well, maybe I might meet, and it wasn't a game show. It wasn't like, by the end of these episodes, you're going to have a man. And It was kind of like it, a it real life process. sex in the city. It was. That's what we kept like talking Lisa about. It's like Lisa in the city. Exactly. Although I did have fights with the producers too. They'd, they'd say like, let's sit in the corner here and you drink this martini. And, and I was like, okay, I'm not <laughs> drinking the martini. This is not what I'm doing. I'm not going to say that. And she's not going to say that. And she's also not going to say that. But we will talk about the topic because you would decide, you know, what you're going to talk about. Right. Um, but it was that and it followed friendships and trying to date different kinds of people and trying to figure out, you know, not. And I ended up in the end not finding somebody on the show. Um, in, in the reality of life, I thought maybe I'll even meet like a cameraman or a grip or, <laughs> you know, because I'm going to be in New York. Break that I, fourth wall. Yeah, well, I'm going to be in a new situation. You know, I might meet somebody really interesting. And I think that's important to do when you're a single person. Keep your eyes open. Talk to people on airplanes. Well, like. I was going to ask you about the dates you went on the show. Yeah. These were real dates. These weren't actors or stage. These right. were like real. How did you find these people you went on dates with? It was like we, we found them through friends and friends of friends and producers who are like friends and, you know, sing because it, it, that's also a weird Venn diagram who wants to go on a date and who wants to go on a date <laughs> on camera and who's in that little middle area so it was it was interesting we were also you know as producers of shows we were trying to to represent different situations that you really get in when you date somebody who might be too religious for you because religion can be an issue somebody you know finance can be an issue like somebody who's got way more money than you somebody who's who might not want to split the check with you or somebody Someone who, who might not want, want kids. Somebody who might not want kids or, or doesn't like pets or whatever. So it was interesting to try to cover those topics based on the different people that uh, were in the show. Did, what was the reaction to the show, especially from women of your age group, of our age group? 
People love the show because, like you said, it was more like a documentary. And luckily, with E, uh, they were not forcing me to like be naked in a hot tub, drinking <laughs> champagne. Like I did if I wanted to. There is a scene you can find it very easily um, where I'm on a Isaac Mizrahi show, and I always show him my underwear. We had like a video of that, and it was really fun. It was a fun and silly moment that I would really do that I really did in that moment. But in general, it wasn't about the extremes. It was about the real thing. And and um, so I still, to this day, get people who tell me they watched the show, they connected to it, because there are a lot of people in that situation, you know? And it not even being like a professional musician, just being a professional person with a busy life who's getting into their late 30s, who probably wants kids, you know, how does it work? Was there any... I don't know what the word is. Not embarrassment, but was there anyone out telling you, like, why would you want to do this? Why do you, oh, yeah. Lisa Loeb, celebrity, obviously can get a man. Why, you know, because why do you want to yeah. go on a show and look for a man on TV? You know what? In the 90s, in the late 90s, I started looking at my job, and I was sitting, we were talking about Japan earlier. Before there were all these great cell phones, I would sit in my chair getting makeup for two hours, three hours, getting my hair done before I knew how to do it, a lot of it myself, spending hours and hours just sitting there thinking, this is not my life. I, I, I'm just sitting here. I'm not reading. I'm not, I can't watch anything interesting on TV. You know, I, I'm friendly with my hair and makeup people, but at a certain point, I'm like, this is just all vanity. This is, why am I even a musician? This is not fun. And I read a book called Finding the Work You Love by Lawrence Bolt. And I looked at my work and I was like, do I want to change my job? And I realized through answering all these, it's a great book if, you, if you're ever interested in making changes in life. Um, he, he helps point you towards what are your values? What do, you, what do you really want out of life? And I realized I like, I wanna connect with people. I wanna hear people's stories. I wanna tell my stories. That's really what I wanna do is connect with people. And I started realizing instead of changing jobs and getting a whole other professional uh, do, uh, document, you know, like a diploma mm -hmm. and going back to school and having a whole other job, there were a lot of these elements of what I wanted to do that were present in what I was already doing as a musician. I get to sit next to people on airplanes and talk to them. I get to meet fans after shows. I get to meet so many interesting people to talk to. You know, we're, we're friendly, like people who I get to talk to and, and meet through my job. And they, again, they tell me their stories and I tell them my stories and that connection is amazing. And I realized even though I didn't want to do a reality show, I thought that might be like, oh, you know, I'm going to be one of those people having a reality show. To tell that story was so important to me. We, we did some, we did some uh, pilot kind of shows before we actually committed to doing the show. And when I realized that I could help tell the story with some humor, you know, and with some exaggeration, but this was important. I was like a lot of other people and other people had to understand also, they don't have to be crazy or wild or whatever. They can be a person who's looking for a relationship and figuring out what's important to them. And so I realized that story was important to tell and I felt comfortable enough to be able to share my experience in it. And it did exactly what I hoped it would do. It Luckily it was a short show. It did not go on for years and years. I wanted a season two. You <laughs> were still it did not looking go on for love at the end of season one. I wanted a I'll produce season. your reality show or right. you're the star of the show. Okay. But um, I, I love telling the stories and I think it's so important for people to, to be able to communicate that to each other and to be there for each other and, and see it on screen. It really does help tell that story and make people feel like you are not alone. And yes, there are ways to continue to move forward um, in your life and your life is important no matter where you are in it, you know, no matter where you are in it. But because I was going to get to do that, then I said, okay, I'll do a reality show. And it was a good show. Well, I have a couple more. They might seem like fluffy questions, but... They're I love fluffy fun. things. I do too. <laughs> I love uh, well, I was going... It's sort of related to dating because it's about little black dresses. We were talking about the Stay video. Yes. That dress. I ha we talked about the glasses. Yes. Where'd you get that dress? Do you still wow. have it? The dress was actually a very dark, deep forest green. Oh. It's so dark that on camera it looked uh, it looked black. And it was a Betsy Johnson dress. Yay. She was doing this faux leather kind of suede at the time. There's another dress I was photographed in a lot at the time that was a dark kind of chocolatey brown and it laced up the front with this like leather lace. So I went to Betsy Johnson. I went to her studio. She helped me pick out a dress. It was a one of a kind. She helped me hem it, so that basically on a hanger it looks like a dra like a shirt. Yes, that's a lot of my. I'm, I'm a petite person. I'm so a lot a, of my I'm, dresses. I'm actually. I think. Look I like think shirts. this might 
Yes. This is supposed to be a shirt. Yeah, it's a dress. Shirt. So anyway, when you're when you're petite, we get to wear dresses as shirts, and it was popular at the time. These little tunic dresses. So it was a Betsy Johnson dress, and she personally was like on her knees helping me figure out the length of the dress, and um, that was my long relationship Aww. with Betsy Johnson. Who Does she do a lot of your clothes? Um, I do or wear do a lot wear of her a lot clothes, of and back in the day, and even before I was a musician professionally, I just love her clothes. Yeah, I do too. So fun, whimsical, smart, clever. The color, the textures, the colors, the textures, the shapes, and they're so easy. Like if you're a busy person on the go, you throw on those leggings, mm -hmm. you throw on those boots, you throw on that dress and you're ready to go. I seem to recall that dress becoming people replicating it or wanting it. it became I was a at Target the other day, <laughs> right before Halloween, and I was like, here's a Halloween costume for me and anyone else in the 90s. Like, <laughs> it was that little dress, you know? It's like short with a little bit of a... Sh sh with a little puff sleeve and a scoop neck. It was the the neck and the hem. Everything about it was so flattering for all different kinds of body types. Yeah. Obviously, it was made for you. But yeah, I seem to recall that maybe like there were um, replicas made of it or fashion or how to get Lisa's look. Yeah, or, I've seen I've seen it on Instagram. Yeah. But again, it is that thing where it's like you get to be you. It fits lots of different body types. You get to be sexy and fun, and it's like it's for you. And other people enjoy it too, but you're on the go and it's just, it's, you put on your docks or your other shoes and you're just like ready to go. And then the other question I have is since I, I did mention the dress I'm wearing, I wore this specifically for you because I know, like me, you are a big Hello Kitty fan. So tell me, and you actually even did like a whole album, Hello Lisa, with I the did. little video with the, with the Hello Kitty in the I kitchen. I did all Hello Kitty. I was a collector of Hello Kitty since like 1978. My friend and I used to walk to this store called Conklin's in Dallas, and we would buy our little Hello Kitty colored pencil sets mm -hmm. and, you know, those erasers that smelled so great. Um, I got to meet, so I, I came out with a record called Cake and Pie. <laughs> all my important philosophies. Why not have both? Cake and pie with and underlined. Why not have both in life when you're asked this or that? Why not get all of it? Um, and that was on Interscope Records. And quickly we realized, you know, I'm not sure if they're marketing the record the way I want it to be. And another label that was run by um, Daniel Glass and Danny Goldberg at the time, they asked if they could get the record and put it out on their label. And at the last minute they said, oh, and we also want you to change the cover and add some different songs. <laughs> and we had worked so hard on that album cover. It was like a very 1950s, kind of painting of me eating a piece of cake, but instead of cake, it was the words cake and pie, like a little dollop of whipped cream. It was a very uh, Herb Alpert uh, whipped cream dress situation. So I, I was like so frustrated. And then in the middle of the night I woke up, I remember I was in Las Vegas, and I woke up and I was like, hello Lisa. That's what the name of the album should be. And it should be Hello Kitty wearing my glasses. And this yeah. was like in 2000 or something. And so I called my Hello Kitty people. <laughs> I had some Hello Kitty people. <laughs> you just had them once. Well, I love Hello Kitty so much, and I talk about it a lot. And and then one day the Hello Kitty people sent me a Hello Kitty uh, toaster, I think, or waffle maker, or coffee maker. One of the uh, no rice steamer was what they sent me. A Hello Kitty rice steamer, this pink color, my favorite color. It matched my pink refrigerator. And we, it, we started a relationship, and so I called the people and I said, hey, is it okay if we do Hello Lisa? And they had to check with the people in Japan. They said that, that instead of just Hello Kitty with glasses, they needed me on the cover also so that people knew there was a difference between Hello Kitty and me. <laughs> so I worked Easily with, confused. Yes, I so I worked it. with the folks up in Walnut Creek uh, in California where the United States Hello Kitty San Rio people are stationed, and I worked with the art directors there, and we, we worked together to come together with a cover based on my old cover my long relationship with Hello Kitty. It, it was so exciting. I got to go to Japan, walk the runway with a big Hello Kitty. We, we hosted, we were presenters at the MTV uh, Music Awards in Japan. I got to meet one of the women who designed Hello Kitty. Oh, wow. I'm still in touch with them and we do so much stuff together, but I love Hello Kitty. You, I mean, Hello Kitty has no mouth. You get to <laughs> figure out how she's feeling and, and she's so beautifully designed and it's so much fun what you can do with her to get the irony of her and the heartfelt nature of her and every small item is like a gift of friendship. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I love Hello Kitty. Do you own a lot of Hello Kitty things? I own so you many. Collect, what's your craziest Hello Kitty item you have? Uh, let me think, well. Or coolest. The coolest or craziest, I have so many Hello Kitty things. Uh, I mean, some of the things I mentioned are pretty great, like a waffle, a waffle maker, a toaster that prints Hello Kitty. Um, my dream, one of my dreams that my friend Adrian and I had was to have a Hello Kitty shaped swimming pool <gasps> when I was growing up. I haven't done that yet. 
It's not. It might be way. in the works. A Hello Kitty shaped <laughs> swimming pool. Oh my. You can pretty much put Hello Kitty on everything. Would you ever do like a collaborative thing, like maybe Hello Kitty Lisa Loeb glasses? That's a good or idea. I should. We should. Little bows. You know they do their own, but it's a great idea. Make it happen, Sanrio. Sanrio. I know. I just gotta make the call. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Hello, Lisa. Goodbye, Lisa. Bye. Thank you for this chat. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much.